uh, Rob, like I know that uh, you know you've you've been very lucky in that you've had access to um, Picard season three before the rest of us, so you know yes, you know what I've, it's like, I've and watched, I know I've watched the season all the way through three times, and you Which, have don't tell yeah. Paramount that or CBS that <laughs> they're they're not my <laughs> biggest fans over there. No, well, I, I, I should that- say. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say that, uh, like, I know you've obviously been critical of the first season or two, and then, yeah, your opinion has completely turned around with this one. And I know from what you've said on Twitter, like, you've <clears throat> absolutely been loving it. Um, I, I have to say, uh, you know who I heard has watched, the, they've released six episodes to the um, to, to various critics or people. And you know who another person who I actually like very much is Dave Cullen, who's in mm-hmm. your neck of the woods. Mm-hmm. And he is hated hated modern star trek and done great videos on it apparently now i haven't had this confirmed for me but he liked what he saw as well and here's here's the thing i've called it the great star trek hostage crisis since 2009 star trek has been uh, in the thralls of people that don't like it there are people that take took on the mantle of making Star Trek. When I watched Star Trek 09, I was shown 20 minutes of it about four or five months before the movie came out. This is J.J. Abrams' first Star Trek movie. I don't think I've ever been seething with as much anger in my life as I was walking out of that 20 minutes. I hated it so much. And then when the movie came out, I had to watch J.J. Abrams talk about on the on the on the interview circuit how he never liked Star Trek growing up. Yeah. That he was a Star Trek guy, a Star Wars guy. So. I have been very dismayed at what Star Trek has become. It's, you know, it's obviously my favorite franchise. I made a movie with William Shatner. Um, I, I love Star Trek and it's something that's been with me my whole life. Now, one of the things, and I have, I hated Star Trek Picard seasons one and two. And the thing was, I spent three years of my life making next generation documentaries that are, if you watch the Blu-rays, you buy the Blu-rays, we, we made Roger Lay and I, June, Roger Lay and I for three years the two of us that's all we did was make documentaries for CBS about Star Trek The Next Generation I sat down and I interviewed the entire cast for hours at a time and I am very fond of all of those people so when I saw the, the, this is a very funny thing so Terry Metall- here's here's some backstory so Terry Metallis who is the sole showrunner of Star Trek Picard season three began his career as an intern working in post-production on Deep Space Nine. Then he moved over and he became Brandon Braga's assistant on Voyager and Enterprise and then went on with Brandon and worked on shows he created like Threshold. And then off on his own, he worked on shows like Nikita as a writer, which was an adaptation of La Femme Nikita. And then he became the co-showrunner and creator of the 12 Monkeys TV series that was based uh, on the movie. And the movie was based on Chris Marker's 60s short La Jete. And so what happened was when he was brought into Star Trek on on Picard season two back on Star Trek, they had really decided what they were going to do. And he wrote a couple of episodes, but he didn't have any control over the shape of the show. It had already been decided by Alex Kurtzman, Akiva Goldsman, Michael Chabon. And they all left to go do other things. Akiva Goldsman went off to do Strange New Worlds. Akiva Goldsman uh, had control over that. He left card behind him. Alex Kurtzman went on to do his pseudo sequel to The Man Who Fell to Earth. So Terry was basically given Star Trek Picard season three because no one else wanted it. And he was told he can do anything he wanted. He was literally given carte blanche to do whatever he wanted. And one of the first things he did was he got rid of most of the cast of Picard that we'd seen in the first two seasons. The only one he retained was Rafi because he had something he planned for her, which you'll see is very different than the the role she'd been given. And then he's like, look, everybody, this show should have been this from the very beginning, but he went back and he got all the original cast of Next Generation to come back. And he got his writing staff from 12 Monkeys. If you haven't seen the 12 Monkeys show, it's, it's, it's really clever, I thought. He got, a new, he got his composer from 12 Monkeys. The music in Picard Season two, 3 is completely different. He got his DP. So even though the trailers look a little 
people are saying it looks the same. It's a different looking show. It's much more cinematic. It when you watch Picard season three, nothing about it after the first ten minutes because they, the first ten minutes are at Chateau Picard and then we're off to the races. But it's <clears throat> it's a very different feeling show. The format is different. Everything about it's different, and you can tell when you watch the first episode. Um, it feels like Star Trek. What Terry wanted to do was make a 10-hour Star Trek movie because none of the Next Generation movies are very good. Even First Contact is lacking, even though Terry, that's his favorite. But it feels like, and I, I, when I say this, I hope people take it in the spirit it's intended. It feels like Top Gun Maverick in the Star Trek universe in the sense that all of these characters come back together. And I'll tell you, in the setup... Like, for instance, Picard hasn't seen Dr. Crusher in 20 years. Dr. Crusher is basically has become Doctors Without Borders, and she's been working on the edge of Federation space, helping non-aligned worlds with pandemics, or she's basically, it's almost like she's working in, in, in third world nations, bringing the medicine and supplies when they need it. She's basically become kind of a medical space pirate with this gentleman that she's working with and all the characters Worf is maybe he's working for an intelligence organization you don't really know and so it's all very intriguing and it's like reading it, 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 you, the characters are very disparate I mean they have to deal a little bit with what happened in Picard seasons one and two but in a way they openly mock it on a number of occasions and when I watched this I was sitting the first time I watched this I was like huh and it wasn't until I got the end of episode four the first four episodes are like its own arc and it was so entertaining and when it ends it ends on a very next generation esque note and then when we got into episode five, there's a conversation somebody I didn't expect to ever see again comes back, and I'm like, oh, my God. And um, there's a conversation that's one of my favorite conversations between any two characters in Star Trek ever. And it, it turns into a big... It, it is not about Honey Bunny taking revenge. It's not a replay of Wrath of Khan. It's a much larger story, and it has undercurrents of real emotion and pathos and I guarantee you I'll make a bold prediction there won't be a dry eye in the house at the beginning of episode 9 and no one dies in that episode I'm just saying that it was I was I was blown away by it now is it perfect no nothing is is, is perfect but it's such a change of any of the Star Trek that we've seen in the last 14 years. You will, uh, the bridge crew of the Discovery, I don't know them, I don't know their ranks, I don't know what they do. The bridge crew of the Titan A, you like all those people. You like all those people in the first couple of episodes. And it, it feels like a science fiction action adventure show. What Star Trek always was at its core, and I'll tell you something else. At the end of episode four, when what's going on is going on, it's about really smart people really knowing their jobs. They're not crying about it. They're doing it because they're good at what they do. Because Star Trek is about the best of the best. And what Star Trek has turned into is a show about how mediocrity is what gets you to the final frontier. And I, Star Trek Discovery, to me, is the anti-Star Trek. Everything about that show is so wrong on so many levels. Star Trek Picard returns Star Trek to where it should be, about human beings and their alien uh, friends striving to be the best they can be and uh, in the face of great adversity and uh, stepping up. And it's not about, oh, if it's what you feel, it's okay. No, no, no. What you, feel is gonna get, what you feel is gonna get you killed. You know what's not gonna get you killed? Really knowing how to do your job and, and working with other people that are really smart and know how to do their jobs. We have to put our emotions aside and get the job done. And that's what Star Trek to me was about. It was about being the best person, human being you can be and finding the best people around you the best of the best to go out and that's what you need to be on the final frontier otherwise you will get killed you will never survive 
and Star Trek Picard is all about these people that are the best of the best coming back together and doing what they do best and it was refreshing to watch I mean it sounds great to hear you know it, it feels like that's what they should have done 14 years ago um, oh. and it, there's a part of me that's like well basically I, w- I want to make some points about this in a second but just before I do um, I know that Jeremy is is pretty much out of time here I know you've got some stuff you need to take care of man um, yeah 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 um, it was pleasure being on with all you guys I won't spend any much time because I think you got a great conversation going but Robert always great to see you we'll have to uh, get you on or I'll have to come on your channel good to see you sir soon. Rip I'm tired of seeing you I see you way too much every day. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So Monday, we'll be ready for that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, Mahler, it's always great to meet you for the first time. And yep, always great. Always <laughs> so you guys have a good one. Bye, chat. Uh, Thanks, Mahler man. out. See you, dude. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I was just saying there. Um, you know, it, it really sounds like they've they've taken it back to what people wanted the whole time, um, and particularly with something like Picard. You know, we wanted to see that reunion of the original cast, and oh yeah, they they kept us waiting for two seasons and didn't do it. And you know, it's great that they've they finally got someone in charge who seems to know what he's doing and is giving people what they've been looking for this whole time. I worry that it's an Andor type situation where it's like, finally, you're getting something that had a lot of thought and care put into it that really captures what people are looking for, but people might not might not necessarily watch it because they've been so burned in the past. You know, and I'll tell I'll tell you what's going to have to happen. First of all, unlike this is wildly entertaining, and it's like Star Trek. It's fun, and when I say it's fun, it's still got big stakes. And there's a lot of emotion, but it's it's you're watching a pulp sci-fi show. I mean, let's face it, Star Trek had go-go boots and miniskirts in the original series, and there was there was an element. You have to have an element of it's 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 pulp sci-fi. Gene Roddenberry sold the show as a wagon train to the stars. He was playing on the fact that westerns were the most popular thing on television back in the early you know early to mid '60s. And what's so great about this is, you know, when you were watching Picard season one, if you watched it, I did not believe that the character that Patrick Stewart was playing was Jean-Luc Picard. I did not believe that he would be writing books in his chateau. That chateau represented a place he left. Now, in Family, the opening of the fourth season of Next Generation, after the the Borg situation, after Locutus, he goes home. But he goes home and he makes peace with it, and then he leaves. The last place, Picard would be an archaeologist on some far-flung planet finding Iconian gateways or something. He would not be a sad sack at home on Earth. That's not what Picard would do. And I understand that to get Patrick Stewart back, he was able to put a lot of his own life, especially in season two, that he came from a real abusive household. And they added that into the Picard backstory, which made no sense in the Star Trek universe, that a mother, a mother, a woman couldn't get the the psychiatric help that she needed. And she ended up killing herself. I mean, literally, they thought that was a good story idea that captain picard's mother hung herself because she was mentally ill this is not a star trek story in the star trek future people get the help they need you know and 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 we have interspecies marriages no one's talking about um you know their pronouns or anything like that we have a much more evolved developed civilization and it's star trek is is again i always say this star trek does not tell you what to think star trek offers things to think about and and it, it it's it's like a lot of other things. It's been frustrating to watch that to happen in my favorite franchise. And not only that, but even in Strange New Worlds, you have the writers openly pillaging other writers and not not crediting them. And like for instance, I'll give you an example: Ursula K. Le Guin, a favorite science fiction writer, she's one of the greatest of all time. Uh, she wrote a short story called Those Who Walk Away from Umlas that I re- recommend everybody read. They stole it. They literally stole it for an episode of Strange New Worlds. Like they outright told that story, albeit in their Star Trek framework. And Alex Kurtzman gets up on interviews and says, yes, we were very inspired by Ursula K. Le Guin's story. Well, they didn't. Cre- they <laughs> very didn't, inspired. <laughs> they, they didn't credit her. And I go back and I you, you go back to the first season of the original series. There's an episode called Arena that everyone remembers because that's what the Gorn is from. Well, that story was based on a short story by a, an author named Frederick Brown. 
Frederick Brown is credited. Um, the backstory of uh, Rebecca Romaine's character, number one, the backstory of her character on Strange New Worlds was lifted from the one Star Trek novel that Dorothy Fontana wrote called Vulcan's Glory. Dorothy Fontana wrote for the original series. She wrote episodes like Journey to Babel, Define the Vulcan Culture. Well, they just took the entire backstory for this character from her novel without accreditation. And, and I get it. The, 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 well, we own that book. We can do whatever we want. At least give her a special thanks. I mean, yeah. she, she shaped Star Trek and turned it and made it what it was, like Gene Kuhn. And they're not giving that credit. Terry Metalis is paying homage and is giving credit to the entire history of the Star Trek franchise all the way throughout Picard. As a matter of fact, there is the most obscure reference in terms of easter egg to a star trek novel i could not believe no one's going to get it but if you've ever read i, I can't I don't want to say what it is but there, i couldn't believe he did it and it's sprinkled throughout the show there is so much love and care put into star trek picard if you are a fan of star trek and also it's just a rousing fun space adventure that has villains and there's conspiracies and there's all different kinds of aliens and there's even there's even it's very subtle but there's a great fuck you to modern star trek in it 